simply put, Joan Nessel is inspirational. She wants to make her world as big as possible. She lets you know that it's you can also do that. And she's a great listener. She actually, for someone who's a great talker, I think it's pretty rare that they're also a great listener. And she is, she makes, she can make you feel that you can do anything. Um, I'm Ann Svetkovich. Uh, one of my books is called An Archive of Feelings, and it was, the title really was inspired by a moment in The Persistent Desire, um, such an important book for me, in which Leslie Feinberg's writing is a letter um, that expresses the hope that the letter will find its way to a place where it will be kept safe. And I think Leslie is referring to the Lesbian History Archives, even without naming it as such. And um, in fact, I think that piece of writing went on to become the inspiration for Stone Butch Blues. So that's just one of the many ways in which your projects have made it possible for people to record their lives so that we have benefit of these amazing transgenerational networks. Thank you so much, Joan, for a friendship that's lasted nearly 30 years. For your courage, for the example of your life, for your wicked sense of humour, and for all the arguments and discussions that we've had over that time, especially whilst collaborating on co-editing the Sinister Wisdom issue on lesbians and exile. Much, much love. Thanks, Joan, and Deb also, for bringing the archive slideshow to Buffalo in the 1970s. It helped me realize there was a place for me as a lesbian in the wide world. The respect you've always had for butches made me feel comfortable and worthwhile. What I appreciate most about you is your fight for class struggle. Joan, I treasure our friendship. Even though we haven't really talked in the last few years, the memories of our friendship still glows throughout my body, never far away. Your commitment to making life beautiful emboldened me to do the same. Although I miss you a lot, I am not brokenhearted. Rather, I feel lucky to have had your vibrant self in my life, giving me wonderful memory as well as points on which to connect in the contemporary world. Hi, I'm Dr. Kyla Story, and I'm just excited that Sinister Wisdom is honoring Joan Nessel and all of her monumental work. Her work touched me at a very young age, particularly as a young femme lesbian, um, and removing femme identity from this relational which identity was monumental and important. So celebrate her always and forever. I live for her and her work, and thank you, Sinister Wisdom, for having this wonderful event. of Joan's words from the famous persistent desire. And remember, Julie, since you claim to be a femme, it is a femme butch reader, <laughs> not the other way round. Okay. I'll just read a little bit. Our this is the afterword to the persistent desire, our gift of touch. My life has taught me that touch is never to be taken for granted. That a woman reaching for my breasts or parting my legs is never a common thing. 
that her fingers finding me and her tongue taking me are not mysterious acts to be hidden away, but all of it, the embraces, the holdings on, the moans, the words of want are acts of sunlight. I still watch with amazement your head between my legs, seeing the length of you, all the years of you reaching for my pleasure. How in such a world as this, where guns and governments crush tenderness every day, can you find your way to that small hidden woman's place? But you do, intent and knowing. You make the huge need come. My life has taught me that touch is never to be taken for granted, that a woman reaching for my breasts or parting my legs is never a common thing. Thank you, Joan. And I will, <laughs> as, as <laughs> this question may be anticlimactic, but I, I will start with it. Um, does fem hunger drive your passion for lesbian history? First, I have to say that's the closest we've come to having sex, Cheryl. <laughs> that was wonderful. I, if I can stop pishing, crying. Um, first, I just have to give my gratitudes um, to Julie, to the, those who put together that show, uh, all of it, and to Cheryl, um, whose work has been such a um, inclusive journey, keeping lesbian and black queer communities going. And so this is an honor. And, and as I said to, to both Julie and Cheryl, no one's really talked to me about my writing. And to have it come from a writer such as Cheryl, is an, I'm glad I lived to be 80 so it could happen. Um, now, you know, I'm good, we're going to get into trouble right off the bat because <laughs> in answer to Cheryl's question about femme hunger, and the more I thought about it, yes, it's driven or, or inspires almost everything I do. And I wanted to just spend a moment on the word penetration because for many communities and many, you know, that's not a word lesbians are supposed to talk about. But for me as a femme, and I'm all, this doesn't mean everybody should do this or be this. The act of penetration was both physically, uh, how can I, physically so reaching into deep places, but more and more as I lived, that opening up, the spreading of the legs, the taking in, did become almost the aesthetic of my work and life. And particularly, I think of things when we were, uh, with peace activists in Haifa and when we walked along the wall and later I was to give a reading to uh, a group of Palestinian and Israeli and Druze women in, the, in uh, La Laisha Laisha, which is a, a woman center. I'm going to cry throughout this. So. Mm -hmm. um, and my image that came to me was I wanted to be that crack in the wall. I wanted to be, and I've had to put it more bluntly, the hole in the wall. I wanted to be, I want, I want, I just want to have openings instead of closing. So for me to, for me, femme, which, you know, is can so easily trivialize, and, oh, Joan, you don't really mean, yes, yes, it is at the heart um, of all the good things, um, of the taking in and then the re, and the giving out of culture. Mm. Mm. And you know, yeah, Sherry, sure. you can stop me at any time. <laughs> oh, you stopped yourself, but please say more if you wish. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> yep. That was deep. Uh, well, I'm going to get off on a slightly different uh, topic now. But your answer to that was uh, quite profound. 
especially the spreading and the taking in. Okay, so I'll go on to the next question. Talk, please, about your experience teaching in the Sikh program at Queens College in the late 60s to the 90s. And I, I, I just want to say I can identify with this because I taught in a very similar program for four years when I first started at Rutgers, 1970 to 74. But please talk about the SEEK program. Yes, yes. I, I, the SEEK program started, actually grew out of, and it's so connected to today. I mean, that's, it's, I, I have, the 1964-65 could be today's newspaper headlines in a way. There were the Watts rebellions mm -hmm. in 1965. And close to 40 demonstrators were killed. Los Angeles had no anti-poverty program. It was, the, it was a call um, that has never stopped, <laughs> um, a call for respect and opportunity. And out of that, and this ties, and this brings up a name that we should know more and more of, Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was listening, she was hearing. So Shirley Chisholm decides as the discontent in the streets reached across the nation from Watts to Philadelphia, to New York, um, to create, to work with other black and Puerto Rican um, legislators in New York state, to create a program called Search for Elevated and Enlightened Knowledge for all mm -hmm. the students who were unwanted in higher education at that time, who were, who, were not given the skills, who it was poor, it was black, it was Latina, it was immigrant. Um, and that program started in 1966 and I started teaching in it in, I, in 1966. It was, and I have to hear, uh, there's so much I wanna say, but all the time I was writing, okay? And all the time I was doing the archives, I was learning in the Sikh program. I was learning histories of decolonization of colonization. And the best way, I, I want to call out Dr. June Bob, or June Bob, who was my, uh, we co-taught courses. She was my teacher. She taught, uh, June who's from Guyana, her husband's from Barbados. So I was actually the student. And in the best way I can sum it up and just be patient, okay, is because it is, Cheryl also talked about rhythms in writing. Because I taught for 29 years, Ooh. these writers, their rhythms entered me again. And it was a very deep entry. So I'm just going to read a list. And if anybody wants a copy of this list, because um, I would provide. So I will just start. Things Fall Apart, um, a Achebe from Nigeria, Masters of the Dew, by Jacques Roman from Haiti, a 1944 so-called peasants novel. Sugarcane Alley from Martinique by Joseph Zobel. And if you ever can see that film, because as I was preparing, Mama Teen and Demuz, they, they came back, the, 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 the characters came back. Um, the Ox Cart by Marquez, a Puerto Rican playwright and novelist. Edward Danticat, Breath, mm -hmm. Eyes and Memory. And just that line of nouns, that entered me. That's that's how you capture, how you slow life down enough in the nouns and the nouns of the body and the intake and outtake of breath. Um, Maurice Conde, mm -hmm. titular Black Witch of Salem. People talk about intersectionality, but it's these writers were doing it way, way, they had to because their histories were intersectional in so many ways. Um, Bessie Head, collector of treasures. Born in South Africa, exiled to Botswana, uh, a brilliant feminist story. And Zora Neale Hurston, their eyes are watching God. Now, I went, before I started teaching in Sikh, I did not know this world of literature. I was trained in Queens College English Department, you know, in English and Anglo history. Um, and then Frederick Douglass, which I taught every turn, the life of Frederick Douglass and learned the glory of the semicolon, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, Langston News, the Just Be Simple stories, Baldwin Notes of a Native Son, um, 
Michelle Cliff, No Telephone to Heaven, Julio de Borgos, a Puerto Rican feminist who wrote in the 40s groundbreaking uh, woman's poetry uh, who dies in poverty in Harlem, um, Nikki Giovanni, Pablo Neruda, the United Food Company, the image of that peasant, you know, the worker turning over and over as he's falling, his lives, the collective lives falling into the the corruption of the American companies that were sapping the life. And remember, my students were teaching me because they were the unwanted students from all these places that had made their way somehow to Flushing, Queens, which, but now it is the most multicultural place in America. But, and, um, and then Nawal El Sadawi, an Egyptian feminist who wrote a story called, There Is No Place in Paradise. And that's about, a, 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 it's a feminist story about how poor black women in her Egyptian settlement setting couldn't even find a rest in paradise. Um, Tilly Olson, I Stand Here Ironing, which my students wrote their own patterns to. And then mm -hmm. Lucio Clifton, and now this takes us all the way back, who wrote Generations, which wrote, she's a wonderful poet, but this was, Generations because my students wrote their memoirs and I learned from that as well. And here's a quote and it goes back to LHA and everything. And she's, she's playing with the Chambers work. Things don't fall apart, things hold. Lines connect in thin ways that last and last and lives become generations made out of pictures and words just kept. All I can say is when you put together these, um, Cheryl, these questions somehow. First of all, you asked me these things nobody else had started asking me about femme hunger and it was <laughs> what was missing, but it also gave me a chance to say thank you. Say thank you to these writers who I can hear their echoes um, and to the students who learned with me, some who still keep in touch and to June Bob, who really mothered, sistered me in the ways of Caribbean language and rhythms and history. That was beautiful. We could stop right here, but we can't. We have to. That was that was quite beautiful. Uh, Thank you, Cheryl. All those writers, yes. Um, could you talk a little about how your experience in the Southern movement, like the experiences recounted in this huge light of mine in restri a, rest a restricted country, which a restricted country is a book that is so brilliant, I can't even describe it. Uh, and uh, I hope it stays in print forever. But uh, could you talk a little bit of, well, not a, well, however much you want, about your experience in going South in during the, 60s yes. when it meant something <laughs> yes. and, and i have to emphasize the little part i played because there were people who gave years to voter registration work and things but again this is another thing so it goes back to queen's college which was the only the working class school where i learned of the world and of other and of the americas so we had something called CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality at Queens. And I joined that. And you know, it was at Queens a year in 1963, I think it was at three, well, two civil rights workers were killed and James Cheney, who was also from CORE. So there was that connection. And um, then I left school anyway, and I, the picture started pouring out of what had happened to the demonstrators walking over the Edmund Petty Bridge. Mm -hmm. And there's one image I'll never forget. And this is about images kept. And it was an image of a black woman 
a middle-aged woman wearing what looked like her church going clothes mm -hmm. and she was walking across but the picture we got was she's flat on her back there's a huge white trooper over her with his baton under her chin and her skirt has been pulled up and you know you just everything all the indignities all the humiliations and all the dignities all at the same time were in that photograph and I, many others many others and was sometime it was i was trying to figure it out i'm living on the lower east side paying very cheap rent that i could take i only it was only a month only a month so but that month it's true, there are many Americas. And I'd never been to the red soil of Alabama. I had never um, been into a sharecropper's home. I'd never been into a small country, one-roomed church in the back roads of Selma. And um, it, as I was there, I said, I will never, never, never forget what I'm learning here. And staying with the white family who took in was one lesbian and this, I went with my friend um, Judith, who was a straight woman. And, but they took us into, they, they gave us their marital bed because when we arrived at um, Brown Chapel, all this, the, the, um, you know, the out of towners who arrived, we were put up on, on the stage and families would raise their hands to say if they wanted to take us in. And um, so Mrs. White took us in and she said, because you look clean, so we wanted you. But it was the most incredible moment. And I, who never had a father, I would make Mr. White's coffee every morning and it had to be made in a certain way. And you could, you know, so, but more, it was the incredible, dignity of a people taking history into their own hands so i don't i wrote about it because i could never because it's mm -hmm. i couldn't it touched every part of me but i played a very small role compared to so many others but yeah and this huge light of yours is also written for arissa reed who was um an african-american lesbian maybe we used to call her yellow pants because she always wore yellow pants who committed suicide um, hmm. much too soon, yes. And so it's dedicated to her and her huge light. She had been raped. She came to the archives to try to heal, but it, she couldn't get over. And, and so, so there's all layers of history in this. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all in the story. You know, I told Cheryl, I, I didn't leave anything out in a restricted country of the sense that I could make of things from my limited perspective. Well, it's a brilliant book. Not it sure. is. Isn't it, Julie? It's a brilliant book. Julie knows <laughs> books. It's a fantastic book. I've taught it a couple of times <laughs> and young, young people love it as much as Cheryl and I and so many people on this call. I, I can't, I, I, I'm, you know, my heart is so full. I'm so far away from you all, but as I see your faces um, on the screen, and I feel, I'm a vis, I can feel you, those of you who want to be felt by me, that, <laughs> but I can, I can see histories and that's, there's always histories in our bodies. And when we touch each other's bodies, if, we're wanted, if that touch is wanted, we're touching those histories. And I, with my eyes, I'm touching your history because I know this way will not come again. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Shimona. Thank you, Juno. Oh, thank you, Joan. Um, now, let me, I'll move on to the next question and, um, I'll just uh, read another section from um, another passage from Joan's writing, uh, her afterward to women on women. Okay, this is about this uh, afterward focuses on lesbian publishing. 
which was quite amazing. Uh, okay. In the 70s, lesbian periodicals, presses, and publishing houses appeared in large numbers. And for almost 20 years now, there has been an alternate literary world of lesbian writing, publishing, and reading, a world that is not, that is alternate not just because the literary establishment acts as if it does not exist, but because a different set of choices is at its heart. Born at the crossroads of three movements for social change, lesbian publishing became a tool for the liberation of a group of people, lesbians, who were still considered criminals in many states of this country and for a class of people, women, who many still thought of as auxiliary members of the human race. Inspired by the vision of the civil rights movement, the women's movement and the gay liberation movement, lesbians created their own social and cultural territories, in their presses and books, in their periodicals and publishing houses, they tried to begin the dismantling of the racist, heterosexist, gender-bound society that surrounded them. And I had to read that because I don't think uh, people give enough credit to lesbians for sort of founding diversity, you know, what we call diversity. Because it was a, well, let me just ask this question. How do you come to your writing technique? How do you work your prose with its uncompromising though gentle intensity, its visceral and tender grasp, like a Luther Vandross song. Okay, Joan. When you were reading those words, you know, I heard the echoes of other writers. I heard Audrey's voice. I heard Adrian's voice. I mean, they're all, we were all collectively saying these things. Be as a way, before I answer that way, remember, I wanted to read something, a short passage, but this is a good, from um, My Cancer Travels, because also this is a shout out to anyone whose body has been altered by, um, by interventions that were necessary to prolong life. Mm -hmm. And um, so this, this, this has those rhythms. So this is, after my surgery for colon cancer and then this is now my battle to win back from the specifics of medical treatment from the outrage of an invaded body where hands i did not know touched parts of myself that i will never see my own body my own body so marked by the hands and lips of lovers now so lonely in its fear Touch my scar, knead my belly. Don't be afraid of my cancer. Enter me the old way, not through the skin cut open, but because I'm calling to you through the movement of my hips, the breath that pleads for your hand to touch the want of me. Heal me because you do not fear me. Touch me because you do not fear the future. One I cancer and sex, one I have and one I must have. Now, Beautiful. I, I am so grateful to Cheryl for so many things. And I, <laughs> but, and I just, you are the first sister writer. I used to run away from other writers because I was scared of them when I was back in New York, who, has addressed the rhythms of my writing as a serious thing. And I cannot tell you what that means to me. 
Um, but my answer to how I don't, I have this odd way because I was always working as, and also doing the archives and all of that. I, I never, uh, the writing, the composition takes place up here. Mm -hmm. you know and then i'll um it only comes out on paper when and so i think it's like breathing that's when you ask that's how it works it 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 comes out and then i'll look it over um but usually the way when it's ready it so how it's why it's so important for me to have read all those to read the list of those writers because they're in there and those rhythms first of all they're the rhythms of the deepest honesty, because I write in moments often of, of this must be done, this must be said, you know, um, and so <laughs> that that has its own rhythms to it, and using nouns, nouns that hold life. I learned that from Dante. Cut. I learned it for, from Baldwin. I learned it from so many, um, and so I. All, I, I don't, I've never seen myself as, as like a writer should be, you know, with drafts and, and you, it's just, I just do it, I do it viscerally, you know, I do it viscerally. But now when I do longer, when I work with other people's work or like, um, I'm very careful and all of that. So, so, but there is a rhythm I always believed and I taught mm -hmm. sentence structure, which I personally love. Not, for so many years and so there's the rhythm of the sentence mm -hmm. oh you don't know how much fun it is for a writer to say that <laughs> i to talk about the rhythm of the sentence anyway oh and, and about the anthologies they were again learning times every time the reason i wanted to do women on women and stuff was because to me an anthology and i think people should say it, it, it is a quilt it opens up the privacy of the author and you together collectively you make a quilt and i knew so many wonderful writers so and then as then when uh other histories of liberation were being formed so ricky and chelsea who are two uh transgendered women came to me and said joan it would really help us if you did this so and it just then and then with um john preston working on sister and brother now that was mm -hmm. he he was dying of aids at the time mm. he died before the book came out and how we laughed because at when we were collaborating he in boston and i in new york a, a lesbian uh, feminist something had come out i don't remember a long essay and it in the back it had a list of writers and under the term pornographers were john and i yeah. so, we laughed we were but I, can i just just something cheryl about writing about the body takes its toll mm -hmm. i have never written without shame without having to fight shame even when i was teaching and my wonderful head of seek wanted to see my book and she was a really god-fearing baptist i was terrified of showing her a restricted country mm. and i'll just tell you one thing when it came out, and Seek was not the real English department, you know, we were. <laughs> um, there were two, June and someone wanted to give me a little celebration for the book. And so I think only one member of the real English department came, but some of my students came, my Seek students. And I was scared because I was a teacher first. I thought, you know, not a, a writer of, of erotica. For the, Anyway, so when they were there and I started by saying, I first want to tell my students if there's anything here upsetting to you, please speak to me afterwards because my job is to help you with your writing, not, I did it. At the end, everybody leaves with these four set of students, these four wonderful women and men came up to me and Shirley who said, Joan, we just want to tell you, you must never teach us out of shame you must never teach us out of shame. And so they were constantly teaching me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. How do we pass 
the work of lesbian erotic writing on to the next generation? It would be really good when we could get, we hear from the next generation to tell us, but I think what Julie is doing, what we on the, you know, first of all, let there be places where their work can be read, where their work can be seen. Let us do it. Now, I talked about shame, but that's an inter, that's something. Let it glow in light. Let it, you know, make it show the political necessity of this kind of writing and I truly believe there is that mm -hmm. um, listen and encourage and um, and respect and difference it will be different we every generation will have a different body you know mm -hmm. How is it to be an aging lesbian since we spoke to um, <laughs> the younger general, I guess we spoke to him in the previous question. Yes, I, um, it, is, it is an interesting time. And um, most, and I asked, I, it, everyone will all have to meet it. Those of us who are lucky enough, that's the first thing, because Cheryl and I both know a lot of people who would have given anything to be able to complain about aching bones. Mm -hmm. um, but once meet it on its own terms and like, okay, I listen to it, listen to it. So I like saying I'm 80. In fact, when I was 79, I was saying I was 80 because I was rehearsing for that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but but I know I, it's, it's uh, aging means letting go. Mm. At the same time, you want to pass on so much, um, but you also have to let go. And that's why it's intergenerational work is so important to me. And that's at the heart of the archives. But I can't age alone. I can only age with many ages. And writing is also a way. You know, because I can always be, I can always be in, other, in the, not that, I mean, I can be with the dreams and the, the necessities of the writers I, I listed for you. With Medusa saying, turn to Africa when he, he's speaking, he's a, he's a village elder in the, um, in, in Sugarcane Alley. So aging isn't easy and it'll affect, but it is, it's not monolithic, you know, and everyone, but it's important to call out. So I want to call out to all older lesbians who are listening and people who, who are here that um, I'm very glad you're here and thank you for all you've given me over the years. Uh, and we, I know the mornings are complicated affairs and I know so is night, but there will come the day. And even when it doesn't, this is why, okay. Why Soma was so important? Why Seek was so important? Why the archives, are, you will have with you when, when, you've, when you've taken on history, when you let history enter you, they'll be with you. That's when you're sitting on the porch or on the chair or on the park bench you will know that you have lived and and that's a pretty good way to age. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Oh. Cheryl, do you want me to show the final video before this next question? Certainly, Julie. From our archive folk yeah. friends. Yeah. This is a very short one. Um, I will share. Oops, I'm sharing the wrong thing. <laughs> You've all done. Technically, it's been wonderful, Julie, mm -hmm. and everybody.
think that this will now work. I am recording now. So everybody get your hair all perfect. <laughs> okay, ready? The Lesbian Herster Archives salutes Joe Nessel for your founding. For your vision. For always finding something positive in everybody and everything. For your generosity. For your imagination and always expanding the scope of the archives. For your ancestral wisdom. For the way you touch people's heart and mine through your words. For your passion. <laughs> my family, my family, my family, you, I'm now I can just cry because if you don't cry after that, there's something wrong. I can't tell you how much this all has, means to me. You deserve it. Ah, uh, Cheryl. And I, I, I just, can I just, Cheryl, I was reading and first, I was reading your story in Homegirls. <laughs> and I said, here you are, 1983, writing about Black youth dying in the streets at the hands of police. And I think, I'm, what a, I've yearned for this connection between us all these years. And um, what an honor it is for me to be in your presence and what work you have done for your two loved communities. Thank you, Joan. Only two? No, Aren't you can have as many as you want. <laughs> oh, lesbians. They make you shake your head. I know. <laughs> uh, we're, getting lots of, we're getting lots of questions. Um, Dr. Clark, can I launch into some questions from our esteemed audience? Yeah, let's, um, because I think that um, Joan has, um, she has uh, answered most, uh, all of the questions that I have, but there's one more that I do have, but go on, ask some questions from the audience, Julie. Yeah. All right, so. Know. So I'm, I'm seeing three. Um, this one is from Brenna Fish. How does Judaism inform your lesbian life? And did your parents know you were a lesbian? What was that like? I first, I never knew my father. I was, well, the first big word I, I learned was deceased. My father died in 1939 and I was born in 1940. So I was born in a, and my mother was quite a uh, Regina quite a uh, under domesticated woman is the way I say it. Um, so her, the, the Judaism I learned from her was the first thing she did was take me down when I could understand to the side of the triangle shirtwaist higher and explain to me what that was. And my mother worked in the garment industry as a bookkeeper. She was gang raped when she was um, 13 on Coney Island, a group of men she met one man. Anyway, that's all in the book. And um, so Judaism for me it, it, it was about social justice, was about foods. That, but I always felt there was always an element of exile from proper Judaism, from proper anything. When your mother is sometimes a sex worker and has both my brother and mother had criminal, you know, it's all that stuff, all that stuff. But um, but certainly the sense of memory and the sense of what it means when one group of people decides you're not really human mm. that has never left me. 
and I have to say, and I'll say it now, because that also extends to my involvement in the pro-Palestinian anti-occupation movement. So that's what being Jewish meant. It meant knowing that history can be your undoing if it's in the hands of the wrong people. And you must be on the lookout, like now, like right now, what Trump and his ilk are doing. So that's my Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jorge asks, how did sister and brother, lesbians and gay men, write about their lives together come to be? How long did it take? And how was it working with John Preston? I'm looking, I'm looking for my book. Um, it was John, John always, John loved publishing. And, um, you know, he was a wonderful, he wrote erotic writings. And then he wrote, um, safe sex erotic writings, but he was also an activist up in New England. And so he said to me, Joan, and we had met over the years, he said, let's do this together. And so, cause he knew everybody in the gay male community that I didn't know all the famous writers. And um, it was, he was ill at the time. And uh, um, it, w it was a long distance project we came together at places like there was a lesbian queer writers uh, conference in Boston and there's a wonderful picture. He was already very ill and we're in a park, in the park and I'm holding, it's all about touching. His head is against my breasts and I'm holding him. Um, he was a wonderful writer. He was a craftsman. He, and I'll just tell you one more thing cause it is not, but, and, I learned a lot. And then we found that stash of papers of letters that had come into the archives about um, between a gay man and a lesbian. It was groundbreaking to work with John because John was groundbreaking. But, and it also made us both controversial. And the book was a failure. John said, you know, the lesbians didn't want to read it. The gay men didn't want to read it. And yet it's a testimony. So I hope it's all my work is out of print. All my work. So Went in odd ways, but in, so that was. But let me tell you one story. And this, the thing I want to say, this is a time, and we know it, in which there are tensions in our community. There are tensions between radical lesbian feminists. There's tensions between transgender people. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of tensions. And part, we must find a way to do, to bridge and take the sting out of those tensions. We must find a way to take in the differences and the new histories being formed without feeling threatened that we're losing something because of places like Sinister Wisdom. We are not losing, I will say this, but, and this is what John did. In John's last month, it would have been, the Lesbian History Archives opened in its new home in Brooklyn. And that would have been 93. And there was a huge, a huge party in the Prospect Park and it was open house. And there must, there was a room. So there was this big park internal space. And there must've been 300 lesbians dancing up and down, taking their top like the old days. And in the midst of it, I see this gray. Now, John was very tall and very thin at that time, piercing gray eyes. I see this very tall man. And then as he comes close and he has two suitcases and the sweat is dripping off him. And it was John. And he said, Joan, I was on my way back to Boston, but I knew how important the archives was to you and I had to come to be here. What it cost him, he was already running these high fevers. That's the kind of thing. So I know the possibilities if we just listen. Mm -hmm. um, That's beautiful. I'll read. Um, there's more in the chat. And um, so everyone knows we'll download this and share it all um, with Joan so she can look at all of the beautiful comments in here as well. Um, I'll read a comment from Chris Anderson, who says, as a girl raised in poverty, then coming out and being femme, your book, speaking out so openly, including about sexual violence and about desire in class and, and, and meant so much to me. I hadn't identified with a lot of lesbian writing before Restricted Country. Mm -hmm. 
And then, and this will be my final question. And then I know Cheryl has another question. Sue Katz writes, are you aware of how many generations you have impacted? I am lucky to have some young friends here in Boston, Bren, Mel, Maggie, Melson, all on this Zoom as great admirers of you. And so the question is, do you continue to interact with so many young people as you always did? Yes. Yes, yes my love, my 67 year old love. <laughs> uh, yes, because, <laughs> because, because their life, their breaths, their, I tell them this, I think they're my eyes to a future. Um, and, and we, and, and just, you know, we hire young women carpenters. We, we do whatever, we just make sure, yes, is all I can say, but not for them, for me, in the sense that I need them. I need them. I need to sit and see how they're making their way in this world. And I need to see their bodies and I need to see their senses of gender, which are different. And I need to see what words they choose Mm -hmm. to make a way in life you know you have to push if you're not wealthy and you let's say if you're not white and if you're not many things you got to push you got to push and um i have to learn how they're pushing and um yeah and i think being a teacher i mean i always learned i know it sounds trite and maybe do goodish but it's not true and so i learned i learned and maybe that's the greatest part of living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Julie? Daryl, do you want to take the final question? Uh, sure. I'll, 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 I'll take it. Uh, unless there's a question from the audience that you want to Okay, you want me to go forward, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Joan, this is the last question. Okay, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 you've done so much work. <laughs> okay, what are you proudest of in the continuing work of the Lesbian Herstory Archives? I think you saw from that. First, I'm proudest that it's continuing. Yes, right. And secondly, that there are different peoples, that it, the um, histories represented, those who hold the archives in their hands and heart now, mm -hmm. represent a much wider scope of histories. And that is how it should be. And younger people, and yes, so I'm most proud I'm most proud that it's the new generations from new or, or from other histories of struggle can see why it is so necessary. Not as a triumph, tri, not as a place of lesbian triumphalism, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. But as a, um, it is, ne but as a place, it, it is a collector of treasures, as, mm. as Ed would have said, and that we can talk to each other there and we can drop our, our um, what's the word? We can drop our hostility. The archives is the place where you can be, find differences still speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. So no, when I, that was, yes. Yes, I'm most proud that it's still that others have taken it into their hands. Right. Yes. I sort of feel the um, well, I feel the same way with sinister wisdom. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, well, people, you know, some people say sinister wisdom when we first started when we were on is this I didn't know it was still around. We got to keep saying, yeah, we're still around. <laughs> yes, right, we are. We are. 
So, uh, so thank you both. Cher, I'm sorry, Cheryl, am I talking over you? No, no, uh, no, Julie, not as you usually do. No, you've been very <laughs> good tonight. You've held yourself back. But uh, I do want to thank uh, Joan for uh, such uh, a sincere and heartfelt participation in uh, her celebration. We made her work really hard. You know, I don't want to leave. Um, I want this to go on and on and on. Oh, there's Blanche and Claire. <laughs> Hi, Blanche and Claire. Well, this is exactly, we all want it to go on forever. This, this, is, this is just to say, we love you so much. We love all of you so much. We liked it better when you lived on 92nd Street and we could go pop in. Um, but someday we'll come to Australia oh, when we can travel I, again. That will be wonderful. And I love you both. And I honor your histories and your contributions. And I've sat in your plays, Claire, and I've read your books, Blanche, and all of us together, all of us together. Oh, all shoulder to shoulder, shoulder, into the what future. We did. <laughs> and now the yes. things you all will do right. and are doing. Yes. 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 So love, I'm going to make, yeah. I'm going to make a quick I announcement. I'm going to make a couple quick announcements and then I'm going to, um, then we'll open it up and people can, can um, say things directly to Joan. We'll have some open sharing and then we'll do our final song. But let me just get my announcements in and then we'll all share more love for Joan. Um, and they're very quick. We have great things coming up. Uh, our next writing workshop is December 5th with the wonderful Alexis Clements on the topic of pinpointing the visual in writing for the stage and screen. Um, there's still a couple slots open, but they're limited to 12 people, so sign up early. On Tuesday, December 8th, we will again have another open mic reading as well as three featured readers. We hope that everyone will sign up for that. An email will go out about that in about the next week. On December 15th, we're talking about Shani Mutu's wonderful book, Polar Vortex, nominated for the Scotiabank Giller Prize this year. Sinister Wisdom, the January issue is already at the printer. If you subscribe to our email, you'll get the cover reveal in December and find out all about the events that we'll be doing in January for that new issue. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We'll put those links in the chat. Um, I don't want you to miss anything. Um, but now uh, we'll unpin um, Cheryl's um, uh, uh, Cheryl's image. We'll leave Jones pinned and if you click to gallery view you will all see, be able to see and I'll, I'm just going to sit back and, and wait, wait, Julie, could I just say one thing honey? Yeah, Because I'm seeing all these faces and I don't know how to do chat with this. Yeah. So if you, anyone wants to talk to me, you know, after this Julie, could you put up my email address someplace or something? Yes. yes. Okay, because I just want you all to know I'm so grateful you made your way to Cheryl and me. No, there you are. It's Nancy Gariano, and I can't tell you how delight, delightful it's been and how just how proud I am. I'm 79, so I'm just a little bit behind you, Joan. You started it all. Well, no, I didn't start at all, but I certainly had the honor and privilege and joy of publishing A Restricted Country. And boy, that book changed my life. Um, I went out, among other things, and bought a black slip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but I will say, I will say that- a black slip, but she never wore a skirt. <laughs> You were not in my bedroom, honey. <laughs> so is the first time. Oh, we're getting oh no, we're getting no, 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 no. Oh no, 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 no. I would I'm too old to go through that kind of roller coaster drama. No way. No way. <laughs> but it's really wonderful to see both Cheryl and 
you, Joan, and to see you looking so well, Joan, and to um, to hear you talk is a real gift because the life force is very, very strong in you. Mm -hmm. And my own experience is that as I get older, I really have to work at keeping that life force flowing. Mm -hmm. um, it's much, the days are shorter, I sleep longer. Um, I feel like there isn't infinite time the way I did when I had Firebrand, when I worked on Firebrand. And so it's, it's, it's a joy, it's a real joy to have a peer who is so full of the life force and able to demonstrate that to all of us. So congratulations. I hope you enjoyed your evening and love to you, Miss, love to you, Miss Cheryl, you handsome woman, you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Nancy. Yes. I just have to say, Nancy, for me, you start, you made my writing life possible. Just for the sake. Thank you. Irene, I'm just taking you made a lot of our writing lives possible. I'm just not sure, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> There's my friend. Maybe, Mark. <laughs> soon, maybe I'll have a manuscript of my own. I've been working. Yes. Good. Yes. Uh, We're I waiting never for thought, I never thought I would be a writer. I always thought I would just help get other people's work into the world. But folks like Cheryl have been pushing really hard. Um, <laughs> so we're I'm waiting on. for it, Nancy. Pardon you, me? We're just, waiting for it. Yeah. Me too. Book. Me too. Yeah, yeah. I'm working. <laughs> Good. I just need to call out some people because I'm seeing Lepa, Lepa from Belgrado, from Belgrade. It's Lepa on. Lepa. Hey. Who oh, does it's work strong. yesterday. She keeps it's with zero. me. Zero. Zero. And I saw a right now. And, and, and everybody, she, and by people who, who made any technical communication I can do possible. I can't thank you. I, I'm taking in everybody's picture. And Roberta Arnold, I, I always think of, you know, the cook and the carpenter. Um, and Paula, thank you so much, my darling. Thank you. And Lisa, Lisa, what a wonderful writer you. I mean, I, this is just Carol. I mean, it's like history is here. These squares, these squares of lives. There are nothing the rain. that are anything but square. Oh. <laughs> and Marina, yes. Oh my gosh. I haven't seen so many of you for such a while. Sherry, where's my Sherry? Sherry Gorelick. Yes, Sherry. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, that's too much of a blast from the past. <laughs> <laughs> you look wonderful. Oh, Jewel. Jewel, hey, Jewel and Diane. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, oh. God's helping me. I, that, this has given me life. You've, I'm not, I'm focused now because you are all there. I can see your eyes. I can see your bodies. I can see your smiles. I can see your questions. I can see your hair. I can see oh. the lack of hair. Yeah. Yes. Oh, there's Jeb. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes, I'm just. And Eleanor, Eleanor from Women Books. Hello, Eleanor. Hello, how many years ago to 92nd and Women's Books? Um. Chuck Waters, who was a writer, I always felt I discovered how brilliant you, funny you are. <laughs> and Saskia, I mean, I don't mean to leave anybody out. I don't mean, and Morgan, Morgan, I've known so many years. And Morgan. Photographs are wonderful. And Karen from, my friend from here. Hi, Karen. And all my Australian friends. I saw Jean and Artie and, mm. yes, yes. Oh, I can't get enough of you. Carol, I'm Carol CJ, who did so much with early publishing and, oh. Oh, that's just my cane. That's right. Thank God I'm doing this from the waist up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much lesbian and queer and every word you want. Feminist history here. Sherry, there you are, Sherry. I see There's you. There's Sherry. We are dancing. We are dancing. Meryl. So, so oh, my dear. Do so I have Shimona oh, start? Start the music so everyone can dance and look let's at say, me. Let's say hi to Di. Oh, there's Jewel. 
My comments, my comments is right here. Can I just say that you It's like just being Hollywood squares. Yes. I couldn't have done that, put them right down to and Cheryl. They always. Come on and say the L word. It's the only change, Carol. This was a great name, and I'd live in shame to try to improve our lives. Come on and say the L word. It's the only chance you got. Stop the lying and denying. And come on, give it a shot. And everybody say, let's see it. Everybody say, let's see it. Did your face turn red? Did you decide instead to save it for another day? Then do yourself say lesbian. Everybody say lesbian. Come on, say lesbian. Everybody say lesbian.
Catherine and Lorraine, are you great poet, you? <laughs> I know, she's so great. <laughs> Where is she? Yeah, she is. Yeah, she's she's there. Yep, I yep. saw her. <laughs> oh boy, what do we do? Oh, Sue, hi, Sue Cats. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> all of love you always. What do? Oh, can we all go to sleep now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we want to dance some more. I will listen. <laughs> I don't think there's a large enough bed, Joan. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll get. Oh, that reminds me of how the stage was built in the Selma to when once we reached Montgomery for all those people. You know, after that five-day walk. Of 500 miles, they took coffins and turned them upside down. Hmm. And that's how a stage was built for all the great celebrities and, and then Dr. King. Um, wow. Every hmm. memory has other memories. That's a, there's a poem in there. I know. <laughs> I'm not going to write it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, may I just say, because I, I can't stop, because to let go of you is to really let go, because I'm so mm. Maybe we can do a group poem sometime. Yes, I, I, I'm saying, you, all of you, all of you, you do, do, put these, put your words down, take your pictures, do whatever, do, do it, do it, do it. You've given Cheryl and I such a wonderful gift of listening, and now just the best way that gift can live on everything we've created is if you speak to life and let and and let let it live for others because there'll always be those who say tell me more well, what was it like how did you finally get rid of trump all those things. <laughs> <laughs> it was a group effort <laughs> oh, God. always is it always I is know. Oh, I don't know if we're rid of him yet. I know that's, that's not true. Afraid. Oh, that's a but we need to reframe the question and say, where were you, Kamala Harris? Yes, you're absolutely uh, right, Amy. Amy. Yes, you're absolutely right. Oh, thank you all so much. And I see Jean and Artie from Australia, from Melbourne. And so, because for us, it's early morning here, and for you, it's getting into night. So when you're sleeping, I'm. I speak into your dreams when I write to you. I, that oh, good. Oh, good. I'm going to go to bed in. early then. <laughs> you will die. <laughs> and my Lisa Davis, one of the great, one of our great writers, Lisa. Could you just, could you just tell the Aussies that we're getting rid of the trash? I <laughs> no uh, yep. In your indomitable uh, fashion, I will, honey. Love you. <laughs> It's so good to see you. You're still the cutest one, Joan Nessel. <laughs> you and Lisa have been my, um, you've been such good friends, no matter in what continent I've been. So thank you so much. There are two, yeah, anyway. Anthologies can only happen to the generosity of other writers. And particularly women on women, we were paid so little by plume to do it and we could had to pay writers out of what we got and so many i'm thinking of jewel so many writers and sapphire we, we gave us one of her, when she was just beginning um and jacqueline woodson um huh. be kind to anthologists because <laughs> they need your support uh and it's a wonderful way to get many in one do you know what i'm saying yeah right That's many true. voices in one place Though who knows, and uh, the new technologies will be. No. Mm -mm. Okay, thank you. I'm really gonna have to. I'm. I am tired, and but I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Oh. You don't want to go either. You thank you, Joan. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, everyone, for joining thank us. You. We will do other gatherings. Thank you. Thank you for doing this, Julie. Thank you, thank you so much. Julie. Love you, Joan. If you ever need so me, I was you here. can so find me. If you ever need me, Julie will tell you how to find me. Any way I can be of help. Okay. Thanks, Julie. Love Thank you. you. Yeah, Thanks, Julie. Julie. Thanks.